for you as a quick intro, um, perhaps the angle that I look um, on that topic. So I was trained as a psychologist, meaning that my perspective is usually on the individual. So this is why we called it, what's my conflict mode? Meaning, <laughs> what's your conflict mode? I work as a certified mediator. So I am in the field of conflict resolution. And this provides me also with insights into, um, of course, conflict dynamics. But I would uh, like to see this topic broader as I understand conflict as um, entangled or escalated negotiations, escalated negotiations. So whenever we try to reach a goal and we are depending on somebody else to consent and opposing or seemingly opposing interests are in place, this is something I would call a negotiation. And I was trained in a certain um, approach. It's called the Harvard negotiation approach. Maybe some of you are familiar with that and I did a program on negotiation. So these are the sources um, I, I'd like to put into these 20 minutes and to provide you with some information I find very, very helpful. As Alex said, I work as a facilitator, coach, um, design thinking trainer, and I help companies in the field of conflict, um, innovation and negotiation. I used to work for SAP, but um, 2017, I founded two companies, one on my own and one with my brother. So that's the angle um, I provide here. Okay. <clears throat> Alex, you already mentioned, so whenever we meet, whenever we are on a team, we do face tensions, opposing interests, um, irritations, misunderstandings. Um, I used to, I used to believe when I was younger that harmony in teams or also in families is the default. But as you probably know the story, <laughs> It's not the default, as conflict is quite normal. I don't know if this is a relief to you. Um, for me, it was somewhat relieving to understand, okay, harmony is not the default, but these tensions and conflict and negotiations um, are the default when we come together, when we work together, when we live together. So conflict is normal. Of course, conflict can be really messy. And <clears throat> if you're like me, <laughs> and most of the people I know, many people dislike conflict. However, if we, if we don't manage conflict well, or if we poorly manage negotiation, there's a high price connected to it. And we can look at this um, from two angles. One is the organizational. You can maybe think for yourself, what are organizational co conflict costs? There actually is conflict cost studies you can find on the internet. And you even can find a calculator to estimate the conflict costs in your organization. And what they find is um, that usually conflict, of course, lowers productivity. So um, you, you waste time on, on conflict um, and the, the company's productivity goes down. What goes up is usually the turnover rate. So sometimes people start leaving the company. And in escalated cases, uh, I hope not in your places, also sabotage and vandalism can go up. If you look on the individual, of course, um, she or he um, suffers as well. And we can see that in lowered motivation in a higher degree of stress, in, or higher, not lower, so stress goes up. <clears throat> but what goes down is creativity and decision-making. And with this, we can also see, I mean, this is also affecting the company. Um, and if we think about um, creative procedures, design thinking, software development, and so forth, um, there are lost opportunities if individuals suffer from conflict, right? So the hope is <laughs> that, of course, we don't um, have to pay, pay the high price for conflict, but that we harness um, through negotiation the benefits of 
diversity, for example. So to use differences um, and not to, not to suffer from conflict, to use these differences for idea generation, for example, or to, to earn something um, that is called win-win. You might have heard this term, it comes from the Harvard project. Or to, to have something um, that triggers your own personal or your organization's development. So to see these situations where opposing views meet as a chance, as an opportunity to grow and to find good and maybe also novel solutions. However, what usually happens um, is that people are either too empathetic or too assertive in a given negotiation or conflict, or that they switch. So I sometimes have this um, image in my mind that it's like a DJ board, like a mishpult. I don't know how you say that in English, but I hope it's understandable. So you can switch it up and down and what sometimes happens in negotiations and escalated conflicts is that we face a dilemma. So should I listen to the other side? Should I be empathetic or should I care for my own concerns? How should I react? Like what should I amplify? And I think this is one reason why many people feel very ambivalent about being uh, engaged in a conflict or negotiation. The second thing that is um, important to know is that conflict for most people triggers uh, autonomic stress responses. Autonomic stress responses. So many people um, find themselves in a very stressful situation where they can't think clearly and they act on autopilot. And there are three typical or three classical um, reactions we can fall into. And the first one is fight, the flight, or the freeze mode. You probably have heard about this, um, this concept. So fight means whenever in a conflict you, you start acting aggressively or assertion kicks in. Flight means whenever in a conflict, we try to look for the door out. We try to postpone difficult um, talks. We, we don't address topics um, openly and so forth. And freeze, uh, whenever in a conflict, we, we give in. I think this is really, um, really amazing to see in the animal kingdom. So whenever there is a conflict uh, between our two cats, we have two cats, one cat always um, starts uh, accommodating and offering, you know, being the, um, the the loser in the conflict. So this is something that um, kicks in when we find ourselves in a in a conflict. What I hope to provide with a um, conflict mode model from Thomas and Kilman is um, a tool basically to increase clarity. And clarity here comes um, from self-reflection. So looking into the mirror and trying to find out, okay, what is my automatic stress reaction? What is my stress pattern when I find myself in a conflict? And what was really a game changer for me when I started dealing with the topic of conflict and negotiation was to understand and to learn that empathy and assertion um, that these are two scales. So we don't have to decide, it's not a dilemma. Uh, it's more or less a paradoxy, one could say. It's still complicated, but we can level both up or we can level both down. So there is some sense um, or some, some possibility, some opportunity to find more flexibility because if we fall into this robot mode in this automatic stress response, what happens is that we find ourselves very rigid and inflexible in a conflict dynamic um, that can lead to escalation. And for me, this already was a big um, eye opener to understand, okay, it's not either or, 
um, I can try to, to train both flexibly. It also provides a sense of agency, or I hope it can provide some sense of agency that we don't uh, need to be this robot, but we can try to clarify ourselves and try to find um, out what is needed in a situation. So this is something I would call situational cleverness to assess and find out, okay, I, I am now in this um, negotiation, what's, what's the right balance? What should I level up or down? And this is how it looks uh, like when we take a look at the Thomas Kilman conflict modes. It's a scientific um, assessment, it's 30 questions. You can find it on the internet. But I think if you see it, you already get a sense of where your tendency might be. So on one axis, we have a surgeon ranging from high to low. And on the other axis, we also have ranging from low to high empathy. So the ability to um, walk in the shoes of the other person, the ability for perspective taking. And the surgeon, um, the ability to speak up for your own rights and to assert them. So it's basically what we had earlier here, but only... Um, yeah, in a, in a graph. And if we take a look at these fields, we can map out five different conflict styles. So let's start here. Let's imagine we are either assertive nor empathetic. You can think for yourself how you would call this style while I draw it. It's called avoiding. So we, it's, it's a flight basically automatic stress report of um, going out of the situation. Let's turn empathy up. So what we get here is a conflict mode where you are assertive. Uh, sorry, not assertive, accommodating. Assertive is here. Accommodating, accommodating, meaning you put your own, um, your own interest in the back and you, um, you give in basically in a negotiation. Or sometimes uh, we try to buy the relationship by making concessions. So this is what we call accommodating. Assertive, what I wrote here, belongs in this field. So you can imagine a conflict mode in which a person would be really clear um, on making his or her own points and would not listen very much to the other side. This is called collaborating. And as you see, it includes both. So being empathetic and being assertive at the same time. And what we find here in the middle field, the common ground, compromising. In the Harvard terminology, we call this, um, let me pick another color for you. So this is called win-win. Both sides look for a mutual gain solution that fits both, both interests. Accommodating, this would be Lowe's win. Avoiding is nothing, nothing because no negotiation takes place. Assertive is the opposite of accommodating. So this would be one person, the winner takes it all basically, win, lose. Compromising, I found this really interesting, is lose, lose. When I first read that, I was like, what's going on? I thought compromise is a good thing. So, of course, there, there, is, um, there are constructive compromises, but um, there are also, in German, we say um, faule Kompromisse, so lousy, lousy compromises. Um, imagine that my husband and I, we are negotiating, negotiating around the topic of vacation. I want to go to the sea, he wants to go to the mountains, and we end up in the middle of nowhere in Germany, both being unsatisfied. So this would be an example for a lose-lose compromise. A better compromise would be to either rotate, so to say, let's go to the sea this summer and go to the mountains next summer. And an even better compromise, which would be collaborating, would, to, would be to ask, uh, why would you like to go to the mountains? And then maybe my husband says, um, I have a friend living there and I want to see him again. And then we could brainstorm, okay, maybe we could invite this friend to join us to go to the, to the ocean. 
And then if my husband would ask, okay, why would you like to go to the sea? I could say, um, I need water to relax, I want to swim. And then we could find a better compromise maybe with a, a mountain lake or with a swimming pool in a hotel near the mountains. So I hope this makes the distinction clear between a win-win or a lose-lose solution. When we think back of the um, automatic stress responses, we find here, was flight. This is fight. And over here we have freeze <clears throat> to give in. And a note for all women in this call, as I think this is highly important, um, there's a gender stereotype um, or like a cultural norm in many places that expects of women to be highly empathetic. And this is of course difficult for many women because it's, um, it's socially punished if we act in a very assertive way. And it makes it really difficult for women to, um, to expand and develop in these directions. However, it is important. And the best tip I've found in the negotiation literature is for women to imagine that we are negotiating for somebody else. And this allows us to act in a much more assertive way or collaborating way. So you might wonder, and this is a question I usually get, okay, interesting. So what's the best style? What's the perfect style? And of course there is no one, uh, no, not one perfect style, but there are use cases for different, um, use cases for all different modes. So when time is, um, when we have little time, maybe a compromise is a good achievement. When we are aiming for a long-term stable relationship, then collaborating, of course, is really a good, good strategy. Um, imagine the issue at hand is not important to you, but the relationship, you want to keep the harmony in the relationship, then accommodating might be a good style. Um, if the chances of getting a deal are very low and the issue is not important to you, then why not avoid the topic? And assertive is a good conflict mode if, for example, um, stakes are really high and you need to make a top-down decision in an organization. So there are use cases. And the good news is we are not fixed. We, we, have, we do have personal tendencies due to um, character or temperament and also training, what we have trained in our life for conflict mode. But we can all develop. And I think this is really good news. So steps you could take, you don't have to take, but steps I would propose is to uh, first assess yourself. So ask yourself, okay, where do I see myself? You could check in right now with yourself. What is your uh, tendency? What is your first reaction when you find yourself in a conflict or negotiation? But number two, take some time and maybe a good a cup of coffee or tea to ask yourself why. I used to be a conflict avoider when sometimes I still am, but it's, uh, it's good to ask um, why. And maybe conflict avoiders are afraid of losing the, the control. They are afraid of escalations. And maybe people who tend towards accommodating, maybe they are afraid of losing the relationship. So take some time to, to reflect and ask yourself why. Could it be that I have a tendency here or there? And then third step, look for training opportunities in daily life. Um, at home, when you are quarantining with your family and negotiating who gets the, the internet or which room to work in or who gets to take care of the kids, for example, at work, um, try to ask yourself, what is the situation demanding of me? What mode? would be most appropriate now. And this provides you with some, some training um, to increase flexibility. So I think if you do this, and I have experienced this on myself and also in, in clients, I've been working this uh, model with, we gain more clarity. First, of course, on our um, automatic pattern but this clarity can also help us to regain a sense of agency, to 
really try to understand ourselves better and then to act maybe in a different, more fitting way. I think leads to more flexibility in conflicts and negotiations. You, you have more ideas on maybe how to react or how to, how to proactively act. And from my perspective, this is also connected to the topic of personal growth. I hope it looks like um, somebody's growing. If we understand ourselves better, maybe we gain more insights into other people's behaviors and conflict dynamics, um, personal growth. And this, of course, also influences teams and um, organizations, ultimately. And the long-term value, I would say, um, it's really connected to our quality of life. So the quality of, of our life, of our relationships. Um, highly connected to our ability to, to collaborate to understand ourselves, to collaborate and to negotiate. And on a systemic view, I would say this is on the topic of organizational effectiveness. So if you go back to this idea of um, high conflict costs, of course, it's really helpful if individuals start um, reflecting and self-clarifying in order to promote teamwork and collaboration. And I hope that you can take uh, some ideas away from this. And if you only remember one thing, I would um, highly recommend this, that uh, we don't have to go into autopilot, but we can choose and have some, uh, some more clarity on ourselves, on our tendencies, but also on what the situation demands from us. So, in a second, I will switch back. We have some time for Q&A, and I saw that there were already some questions in the chat, so I'm really happy to, to talk with you. But first of all, thank you. And if you, if you would like to connect, um, feel really free. I'm happy to connect via LinkedIn, um, and you can find information here on both websites. So I would stop it here, um, Alex, and switch it back to the camera for the, for the questions. If it's okay. Thank you very much, Anna. So uh, thank you for the beautiful talk. Uh, there are a couple of questions in the chat. Um, for example, uh, Brad is asking um, whether whether you could um, whether you could share some studies on the some specific conflict cost studies. Oh, yeah, I can send a report, but it's in German, I fear. So I have one report on my. Uh, on my laptop I could share, um, but are you looking for studies uh, in, in English, if I'm not mistaken? Brad from Chicago, right? So you would need some English references. I would need to, to look them up, but if you Google them, I would be really optimistic that you find, um, so if you Google conflict cost studies, uh, Google hopefully will provide also English material. Um, I have awesome. a tendency towards German-speaking material. Yeah. Uh, Mara is actually writing uh, that uh, the report in German will be um, good as well. And, okay. Yeah, and even uh, suggesting to translate for Brad. Um, oh, wow. Uh, there is a follow-up question. Uh, is organizational effectiveness uh, the same as organizational health? I don't know how organizational health is operationalized. Um, so. I, I, if I was to answer that um, scientifically, I would need to know how is organizational health, how is it operationalized and measured. But by organizational effectiveness, I, um, I meant, you know, um, the opposite of these conflict costs. So um, productivity that is not impaired by conflict, for example, or uh, turnover rate that is not damaging the company. Um, as we know from from these conflict studies that they really do impair organizations as whole, even though they, the conflicts might be on um, team level. I think this is really interesting. They are on team level, but they do affect the, the entire organization. 
Uh, and I uh, also have a question. Uh, actually, you have mentioned, men, uh, you have mentioned um, assessing your own um, behavior, your own conflict mode. And uh, would you have uh, a suggestion, an advice on um, how to how to how to manage assessing, uh, like taking the step back, back and uh, being able to assess uh, your uh, behavior in a, being in the middle of situation? Because uh, to me personally, that's that's always very difficult. Fabulous question. So if I understand it correctly, if you find yourself entangled in an automatic habitual response, how to how to break out of it yes, in the middle is. of the conflict? Okay. It's, it's difficult, I think. I mean, the first achievement is to already notice that, right? Um, if we are on autopilot, we should really, we don't notice that until afterwards. So I think that's the first very important step to, to have some um, mindfulness I mean, it's the word of the of the time, but to be, be mindful of your behavior, step number one. And if you uh, feel entangled in this um, automatic response, I would take a break. So either get out of the situation or propose a break. So say something like, okay, why don't we take five minutes just to, you know, let some air in and you can go outside and try to calm down. Because when we are in this state of acute stress, I think it's really hard to make good decisions. Yeah. So when I work as a conflict mediator and I sense that stress levels are really going up, I always propose a break because um, then discussion can become more uh, constructive again. I hope it answers this uh, fabulous question. It's, it's, I think, the key to notice. Uh, thank you very first. much. Thank you very much, Anna. And, uh... Sure. Uh, big thanks everyone to the questions. I would suggest us to uh, stop the Q and A to uh, complete the Q and A part now. Stop the recording and switch to a uh, more of an informal conversation. All right, That's great, good. great. How does it work? Um, I will disable the recording right now, and then we can dive in. Perfect. Okay.